don't even know what's in the criminal code. Even the police, the police very know, know very, very little on what's in the criminal code. So it's an important, uh, important procedure that I, I really hope more of us start to use in the future because as long as Dave Lindsay or two or three other people are doing it, what do you do if they shut me down and don't let me in the courts? There's got to be a lot of people behind me that come up and say, hey, we're here to do it too. And we're getting those people. They're coming up very, very quickly. In the last six months, we've had uh, several charges laid. Uh, I've laid charges against the cop, Constable Chizoski in Vancouver, Langley last year, for what he did to me. And they had two charges against me. The officer falsified all this. No, everything was falsified on it, as, as Vern and several other people who were with me that night can testify to. And they were adamant they were going to proceed with a prosecution. And these crowns, they all talk to each other on their chat lines. They know, they, believe me, they know who I am. And they decided they were going to prosecute. They weren't backing down. In June of last year, we went for a disclosure hearing. Judge Raven ordered them to provide every document that the RCMP had on me in British Columbia. They, uh, that's when they broke down. And then they found out my challenge on the RCMP on jurisdiction. And I got uh, a letter from a phone call from them two months later. Mr. Lindsay, oh, this is actually after I also charged them. I charged the officer with assault. And they phoned me up and said, Mr. Lindsay, we're staying everything. We, we just don't want to deal with it. They stayed all the charges against me and they stayed my charge against the cop because they didn't want the cop getting convicted. Now, a lot of people would go, wow, hey, great. I don't have any more charges against me. I don't. I got really ticked off. I wanted those charges to go ahead. I wanted to get this guy on the stand and, and really crucify him, and it didn't happen. But although the Crown can intervene after you've laid a criminal charge, if they're going to stay it, they have to give you reasons. And if they're doing it corruptly, you can take the Crown prosecutors to court to overturn that and force them to proceed with your charges. The, um, how many, um, how many people here are scared of going to court? <laughs> Not too many, right? <laughs> <laughs> I want you to know that I've been in court over 150 times in Canada, and I still get the butterflies every time I go to court. Every single time that I walk into that den of corruption, I get the butterflies, and it, it's oatmeal. It lasts anywhere from 5 to 10 minutes, it could last 15, 20 minutes, depending on circumstances and what's happening. You're not alone if you got the butterflies or if you're scared of going to court. I don't like going there too much myself. And, um, but I want you to know that there's some fears that you have to get rid of in this country if we're going to achieve some success in what we're hoping to, uh, to do. Number one, you've got to get rid of your fear of going to court. You, you may still always get the butterflies, but you have to get rid of that fear. If they ha hang that in front of you and say, hey, we're going to take you to court, and everybody goes, oh, no, I don't want to go to court. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. And I'm scared of taking on Canada Customs or whomever. You've lost. You have lost right then. That's it. Because you're doing what they want you to do, and it's unlawful. The second thing you have to get rid of is your fear of going to jail. It's not a holiday, believe me. Um, it's not a pleasant place to be. But if they hold that carrot in front of you and say, listen, you're going to do what you're told, or you're going to go to jail. They've won again. You look back through history, how many people have gone to jail for what they believe in? How many people, <laughs> how many people have gone to jail that shouldn't have even been there? There's so many, you can't even count. And I had to come to that realization a long time ago, get rid of the fear of going to jail. And I shouldn't say get rid of it, you never get rid of it. I still have a fear of going to jail. But the point is, if you let that fear control what you are going to do, again, you've lost, and, and these people have won. You have to get rid of certain, certain fears in dealing with these people. I think, to a certain degree, possibly the most important one is to get rid of your fear of materialism. How many people own a, think they own a house here? Not too many? Okay. I used to own a house. I, I gave it back to the bank last year. I signed it away. I did it voluntarily. I could have fought them, but it wasn't worth it. And 
I know several other people that have lost their houses. So what? It's a lot more less I should say a lot less stressful to rent than to own, believe me. I know people that have lost their cars, so what? Go buy another one. If they hang if they are able to dangle that carrot of materialism in front of you, and people are scared, I'm gonna lose my style of living, I'm gonna lose my house, my car, or this and this. <laughs> They've really got you. They have really got you. If you have any of those three fears that are controlling your actions, they are controlling you. And you cannot have those. A friend of mine called me up several years ago to reiterate a, a, a good point uh, that several people are already aware of again, but Vern phoned me several years ago when I was helping him on his court case. He had 12, 11 or 12 charges, 11 charges against him and his company for failing to file. And he, he phoned me up and he was really worried and he said, you know, Dave, I've never been charged with any of this in my life. I said, I could lose my house, I could lose my car. He said, I could even go to jail. What do I, what do, I do? He said, my business is on the line. And I said, you know, Vern, at that point, I, I didn't have an answer. I said, you're right. But I didn't know how to respond. And I said, you know what, call my friend in Winnipeg. His name's Ted. He used to work for Canada Customs until he uncovered a billion dollar fraud and they turfed him. And he phoned him up, and I knew exactly what Ted was going to tell him. He phoned him up, and, and I expected Vern to call me back up a little bit later and go, Dave, what the hell are you giving me this guy's number for? I, I really expected to get heck from him when he called me back. But I, I, had no other, I, I didn't have any other suggestions. And, you know, he called me back, and he said, Dave, that was the best thing you ever did. He said, I can't believe the change. He said, his, his view, attitude just changed. And I said to him, tell me, what did, what did Ted say to you? And Vern went and told him everything that was going on, same thing he told me, and Ted just went and told him what I had anticipated. So what? Big deal. They are the criminals. We are not. Fred Carbers went to jail for three weeks on driving without license charges. He taught everybody in there. I've been in jail. I haven't been there for three weeks, but I've taught people in jail. Eldon Warman spent a month in jail. He was teaching people in jail. These are some of the top people in, in Canada that have gone to jail. And the point is, so what? They are the criminals. You know what is right in your hearts and in your minds. And if they're going to dangle any carrots in front of you and control you, then they, then they really won. If you've taken those three areas and you've taken them in, into your control and said, I don't care. If I have to, I'm going to go to court and fight them. If I go to jail, I can appeal, I can still fight. And in most cases, you're out within a few weeks or a third of the time anyway. And if you take away that fear of materialism, you now have a major source of power that they're at a loss. To, to, what do they do? What do you think they do with criminals who are in there 20 times? They, you think they're going to give them 50 years in jail? They get the same, after the third or fourth time, they just get the same sentence. They know it's going to repeat and they don't care. And that's the attitude you have to take. The court cases that currently I'm involved in are uh, a few of them, but the, the ones that have had garnered the most interest clearly are, are Westman and Debbie's, as, long as, uh, as, as well as Ed Dix in, uh, in Vernon. Uh, first of all, I'll talk with Ed for a second. Um, we filed a constitutional challenge in provincial court. It may have to go to the Supreme Court yet. We're still looking into that. On his three charges of failing to comply with the notice to file an income tax return. And I told Ed from the beginning, uh, for those that talked to him yesterday, he may have told you, I said, I'll help you, but I said, if I do it, you're sticking with it to the Supreme Court of Canada. He said, I'm not going to help you for, for you to back down if you lose the first round. And I'm not sticking with it for you to come up to me and say, Dave, I don't have $200 to file an appeal. I said, you sit back and think about what it's going to cost financially, what it's going to cost in every other aspect of your life, and if you're prepared to take it. And I said, if you are, I said, I can tell you right now, I can get you the support of everybody in the freedom movement in Canada. But I said, nobody's going to do it if you back down and, you said, and all of a sudden rolled over. I, I think we're kind of tired of, of seeing that. So he thought about it. And he called me back several weeks later and he said, Dave, let's do it. 
So we filed a challenge to the charges. The Crown Prosecutor, Peter Francis, immediately objected. Immediately. We, Lindsay can't be here. He's putting all these arguments that have already been decided upon, <clears throat> and it's just going to delay the case. Our case is 20 minutes, he said. It's over and done with. It's a simple case. He's guilty. And uh, I, I, I said, no, no, I'm allowed to represent him. He has the right. And um, at one point, the judge, Associate Chief Judge Stansfield, looked at him. He said, what's the difference? He said, if Lindsay puts these arguments forth, or Dick has to go out and get a lawyer and do it. And this, this um, Crown Prosecutor, Peter Francis, stood up, and we have the transcripts of it. And it's not verbatim, but he stood up and basically said, A, lawyers are officers of the court. There's certain things they cannot say to the court. And the gasps from everybody in the courtroom. This judge who always had a smile on his face, all of a sudden, just like Vern got yesterday, he got the look, okay? And he looked right at the crown, just gave it, the smile was gone. You said too much, shut up. <laughs> but the point got on the record. A lawyer can only do so much. He can't, I can say anything to the court, absolutely anything. A lawyer cannot. Um, Rose, are you still here? She's walking around. She was talking yesterday. Uh, about a lawyer from Winnipeg, uh, Prober. She mentioned him in passing. I went up to Jay Prober a couple years back and I said, Jay, here's my case. He's one of Winnipeg's top lawyers. And I said, would you be willing to, uh, to take some of it on? He started laughing at me. And he looked, he said, Dave, if I took your case, he said, I'd never win another case again. And that's from Winnipeg's, one of Winnipeg's top lawyers. They cannot say everything in court. They're hamstrung. So, Francis lost. We had a 26-page decision in our favor that uh, I could represent Ed. And a uh, very, very strong decision in our favor, I might add. It's been quoted several times in other areas of Canada as well. And we've gone on since then to, uh, it's taken probably six, five days, four, four or five days now, and uh, three days of actual hearings. Um, Eustace Mullins was on the stand as an expert witness on the central banking system. Vern. Warwick, who was talking yesterday on the money, money system, was an expert witness as well on the money system. We've had two of them that were accepted by the court. Cross-examination of uh, Mike LeBlanc from Canada Customs. And um, the Crown has done everything to try and derail this. There was an agreement that they would get some answers to questions for me. They didn't do it. Then there was a court order that they give me some names of the Bank of Canada that I could contact to subpoena them into court. I wanted to see you know, who's qualified to be subpoenaed because I don't know who's in the Bank of Canada. They fought vociferously. At one point, he even, he even stated on the record he was going to violate a court order. This guy came that close to contempt. And he was ordered to provide the names. The names he gave me, he was, he was told to do this four months ago. The names he gave me were two weeks prior to trial. Two people in uh, Ottawa, one out here, and they wanted me to pay $9,000 to get him to court. I interviewed the guy out here. He didn't even have a clue. I've never dealt with that issue, the Bank of Canada and dealing with that. He said, all I'm required to do is deal with the stuff on how the notes get printed. He had no idea how money comes into circulation, how the bonds and T-bills come into circulation and so on. Didn't have a clue. Not a clue. <clears throat> so I walked back into court and I, 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 for the first time in the hearing, I got furious in court. I really got mad. And uh, the judge agreed. The Crown was not treating me with respect. He was not treating the court with respect. And we had an application for costs in right now probably get decided at the end, but he has come out on no less than four occasions and given the crown hell in this case for their actions and how they've tried to stonewall it. We still have at minimum five full days of hearings to come yet. It is the longest case in Canadian history on failing to file charges and this from a crown prosecutor said it was 20 minutes and that's all it was going to be. Right? <laughs> So his case as it stands right now, the next date for court is October 29th, five days, that whole week has been set aside. The application, as I put in from the beginning, I wanted the name initially Paul Martin, but I told him I would be happier to settle for the Deputy Finance Minister and the Senior Deputy Governor General. They're the ones that do the hands-on policies with, with each department. How money's created, where the income tax goes to, uh, to provide all that and so on. That application has come a full circle around because originally the judge didn't want one. He said, no, it's not going to be a political hearing. It's not going to happen. Well, how many hearings have been political? You talk Keekstra, you talk Morgenthaler, you got Zundel, and the list goes on and on of political hearings that took place in this country. There's, there's hundreds of them. And whether he wants it political or not, it's going to happen. So 
he's going to rule in the next week or so who we're going to get. In my opinion, it's just a question of who we get. We will get somebody from the Department of Finance in Ottawa, and in my opinion, we'll get somebody from the, the Bank of Canada as well. And it's just a question of who we're going to get. Neither one have been on the stand. This issue, uh, and I should, before I, I go any further, I'll just briefly explain the issue. We challenged income tax on three grounds. Number one, as Eldon Warman and Alex Mulganey teach in Canada, the issue of contract, and it's an artificial person. We fought this in Ottawa last year in Tom Kennedy's case, who was speaking the other day. I was his agent in Ottawa. Essentially, the judge came out, Justice Sedgwick, and said, I agree, Magnus Carta is a constitutional document. He said that right in his decision. Then he went on to ignore everything in it. So that is under appeal, being heard at the Court of Appeal either late this fall or early next year. We've put that argument, we learned a little bit from it, and we've put the argument with a couple changes now in, uh, in Ed Dick's case. The second issue is with the British North America Act. It's an issue that's been argued time and again. However, there are some significant differences this time. We have documents that have never been put to the court in Canada before. I've got a letter from Sir Charles Tupper, who was there in the London conference and contributed and wrote, helped write the act. Never been on the record in Canada before admitting that the federal government cannot levy an income tax in this country. We got people in Edmonton um, that we're going to be talking to to get even more documents. That they've been in the archives that nobody else has ever even been into in Canada before. And we, we will be getting more documents to file in the court. One of the, the major problems with the BNA Act is in 1924 in the Carrot case, they came up and said the federal government has the ability to tax by any motor system, they can do whatever they want.